And it's now time for questions to the Minister of the Environment. Can I inform members that questions 8 and 12 have been withdrawn? And I start with Declan McAleer. Pest of hand, question one. I have appointed the chair of a working group which will shortly commence a review of the Northern Ireland Local Government Code of Conduct for councillors. That working group will review the principles in Part 3 and the rules on decision making in Part 8 of the Code by February 2016. I will consider the outcome of the review and any proposed changes to the Code of Conduct prior to consultation. It is important that the local government sector has an opportunity to put forward its views on the Code and the working group will be engaging with key stakeholders and inviting them to give their views, either in writing or at a stakeholders engagement event. The review will be completed and consultation on any revised Code of Conduct will commence during the current mandate. However, I have asked the Chair of the Working Group to seek the views of key stakeholders on the possibility of shortening the timetable for the review to enable the consultation to be completed and the revised Code be in place during this mandate. Well, Declan McClear for a supplementary. Uh, Graham Alga, thanks to the Minister for his answer. Is the Minister, conf is the minister confident that the anomalies in Section 8.1 of the Code will be rectified in a way that will enable councillors to lawfully interact with each other? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the member for that question. Uh, part 8 is the area. <laughs> Here that has, I think, caused most consternation and, indeed, I think it's fair to say, confusion among uh, councillors and NILGA as their representative body. Uh, many of the issues revolve around the fact that it can be interpreted to actually dilute or emasculate their performance as an elected representative. The concerns that they have expressed as part of eight of the code are they considered that they wouldn't be allowed to organise support for or opposition against a particular recommendation or matter being considered? They wouldn't be allowed to lobby other councillors on a matter being considered or comply with political group decisions on a matter being considered where they different from that councillor's own views. And they wouldn't be allowed to act as an advocate or to promote a particular recommendation in relation to matters being considered, and as a result, councillors would basically not be allowed to be politicians or public representatives. The working group will look at each aspect of these concerns and Part 8 in general, and I look forward to receiving its comments. And clearly, I am hopeful and confident that these issues will be resolved. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister assure the House? that whenever the reviewed uh, code of uh, conduct will uh, see the light of day, that we won't have a repeat of the position that we have at the moment, where there is at least one councillor in Northern Ireland, in Londonderry and Strabane, who not only has been convicted of a criminal offence, but has repeatedly not only refused to condemn terrorist incidents, uh, a supporter of dissident Republican activity, and I'm sure the Minister is well aware of, who, of whom I speak, uh, that that person remains an elected representative and cannot be seen to have breached the previous Code of Conduct. Someone wrong. Mm. Uh, th thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for his question. The aspects of the Code that are being reviewed are Part 3 and Part 8. I have uh, described in, in detail the implications around Part 8, which pertains to decision-making uh, by councils and councillors. Part 3 deals with principles, and that would hopefully address some of the concerns that the member has raised. I can't preempt the outworkings of a review, but it will go out to consultation, and the member and party colleagues will have an opportunity to take part in that consultation. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, why is it essential that we have a workable code of conduct? Do you agree that it's important that the content of that code or protocol should not 
become a tool for vexatious purposes by political opponents. Uh, thank uh, Mr. Cree for that question. I'm sure no political opponents would stoop to such depths as to use what is written in the code as a means to attack or uh, detract uh, from a political opponent. I think it's vitally important that all members adhere to what is written in the code and also to what is not written in the code as, to, as with regard to the respect with which they treat their uh, fellow politicians and members of the public. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Will there be any opportunity to write into the code an obligation on councillors to request and receive allowances only to their personal accounts to end the abuse which is presently ongoing with Sinn Féin councillors in some areas and if it can't be done within the code, how is the Minister going to deal with that abuse? Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Allister uh, for that question. I am aware of the situation again uh, to which the, the member refers. However, I fear that this review will not provide an opportunity to address that anomaly, as he quite rightly identifies it. Both primary and subordinate legislation clearly state that councillor allowances are payable by councillors directly to councillors. The relevant legislation is contained in Part 3 of the Local Government Finance Act 2011 and in the Local Government Payment to Councillors Regulations 2012. In light of the recent court proceedings, my officials wrote to all district council chief executives to remind them of this legislation, but the legislation is silent on which bank accounts councillors' allowances must be paid into. It is something I have written to uh, council chief executives on. It's something I will be speaking to them all about also in the very near future. Whereas in the Assembly here, the Assembly does have the power to investigate that whatever account number given by a member is actually a personal account. Councils don't have that investigative duty or power. Call Ms. Megan Farron. Mr. Rideau, question two, please. Uh, uh, thank sorry, you. Uh, sorry, Minister. I understand there's been some administrative error within the system. I understand you have been informed that the question has been withdrawn. The member has not been informed that the question has been withdrawn. Um, the, another department may well answer that question on behalf of the member. We go to, we go to Mr. Trevor Lunn. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three, Minister. Conscious of the difficult operating environment and the fact that current funding arrangements finish on the 31st of March 2016, I had indicated that I would urgently consider the development of appropriate funding mechanisms to enable third parties to deliver key environmental outcomes from April 2016. I have listened to the views of stakeholders who, in particular, sought certainty on funding and multi-year funding, and I am today announcing a new environment fund, which will cover two years with a possible extension for a third year. Funding will be allocated for the next financial year, 2016-17, with the potential for funding in future years, subject to future budget decisions by the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly. This is a broader fund than the previous Natural Environment Fund, and this new fund will cover delivery of a wider range of key environmental outcomes under two broad themes. Ensuring good habitat quality, landscape and species abundance and diversity, and promotion of health, well-being, resource efficiency, and sustainable economic development, realizing the full value of our environment. It will provide a more comprehensive, transparent and consistent funding mechanism by which the majority of environmental outcomes can be delivered by third parties under grant aid. Alongside the Environment Fund, I have also recognised that the Department will continue to need to develop additional mechanisms to support the delivery of environmental priorities 
in 2016-17 and beyond via funding to third parties. Call Mr. Lund for supplementary. <clears throat> Yes, well, I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive answer. It's quite a coincidence that he should be launching the fund on the same day as I asked that question, but he has completely killed any opportunity for a supplementary, so thank you very much. <laughs> call Mr. Phil Flanagan. <laughs> I'll ask him, I'll be honest, I wasn't really listening to the Minister's answer, so I don't know whether he's answered my question or not, but I presume he hasn't because I'm asking him about something else. Uh, can I give us an update on the, uh, the, the scheme that he announced back in June, where, similar to the plastic bag tax, um, he's, he's proposing to bring in a, a deposit return scheme for, for bottles. So, can you give us any update on that there, off the top of his head? I thank the member for the question. The link is quite tenuous. I think the member gave that away himself by saying he hadn't listened to my previous answer but was going to ask me about something uh, completely different anyway. I have uh, floated the idea of introducing something along the lines of a deposit return scheme for drinks containers or bottles, uh, l largely, uh, at the start of the summer. And so since then, my officials have been working on it. We've been looking at and learning from other jurisdictions. I know Scotland had run a pilot on it. We're looking now at the results of that pilot, and it's something that I will actually be speaking to my counterpart, counterpart sorry, that's another vessel, uh, counterpart in Scotland, uh, Minister Lockhead on in January uh, when I visit him. It is something that I see great opportunities existing and also great opportunities not just for our environment but also for collaboration with other jurisdictions. There would be considerable outlay involved if we are to uh, proceed with this scheme, but I believe that the expense of that initial outlay can be offset or, uh, and greatly reduced by collaborating with those in Scotland and potentially those in the Irish Republic as well. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. What would the total value of the fund be, and will you ensure that the funding will be available to ensure effective management of areas of outstanding natural beauty like Mourns? I thank uh, the member for that question. As of yet, we haven't got detail on how much will be available. I am working on that with officials currently. It is vital that these organisations have certainty as early as possible, and they will be able to apply from this week. I uh, intend to open uh, applications from Thursday, and they will have a month up until the 10th of December uh, by which to apply. In the meantime, we will be working on how much money we can make available from the fund, as the fund is broader than the Natural Environment Fund that I established this year, I would hope that the pot uh, will be bigger in terms of, of, of finance available as well. It will be broader also in that it will be able to assist groups like the member has referred to, who ensure effective management of areas of natural beauty, such as the Mourns. I think it is worth underlining that even this year, with extremely, as an extremely challenging budget outcome for my department, over half a million pounds uh, was allocated to various environmental NGOs to continue to provide a full range of environmental and visitor management services for areas of outstanding natural beauty. Indeed, it was mainly for the Mourns area. I can also confirm that these organisations will be able to apply for funding from the new Environment Fund, which I have spoken of today. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I am absolutely delighted at uh, the Minister's announcement uh, today. I uh, am sure the sector is very assured, reassured uh, by the announcement today. And I understand the Minister saying he is still working out about what, what money there is going to be. I just want to ask the Minister, what about the, <coughs> sorry for my voice, what about the built heritage uh, sector? Are they going to be protected too? Uh, will they be assured of further funding uh, from this pot? Uh, I, I thank the Chairperson of the Environment Committee uh, for this question, which is indeed very topical given the detailed report, which I believe was given comprehensive coverage on BBC uh, Talkback today. 
This fund that we're talking of today is an environment fund that regrettably will not be able to be availed of uh, by built heritage projects. However, I do very much value our built heritage. I think that's indicative of the funding that I was able to provide it in the previous financial year, and I think that should be looked at rather than how much I was unable to provide in that direction this year. Uh, the, the function of built heritage will actually lie. It, it will go in a different direction to that of environment. Under the restructuring of departments, uh, built heritage will lie within the Department of Communities. However, I believe it's extremely important that its importance and its value is recognised. Built heritage plays a massive role both in terms of promoting our economy and indeed the, the, the health and well-being of our own citizens. I have spoken to officials about the importance of this. They recognise the importance of this. It has frustrated my officials within the NIEA greatly that the only money that we've been able to allocate to built heritage this year has been through the carrier bag levy. We were able to allocate almost £600,000 to uh, buildings that were deemed to have a community uh, function or, or benefit. I'm aware of the number of buildings of, of great value out there that really need work done, and we are working on a way to do just that. Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question four. Since April 2015, district councils are responsible for determining the vast majority of planning applications. Under the reformed two-tier planning system, applications for local and major developments are submitted to and determined by local councils, while applications for regionally significant developments are processed and decided by the Department. The Planning Act also allows the Department to direct that any planning application be referred to it instead of being dealt with by a council. In recognising and respecting the important role of councils in making decisions on the future development of their areas, I only envisage this call in power being exercised in exceptional circumstances. I believe that councils with locally elected and accountable representatives are best placed to take key decisions about the future growth and development of their local areas and communities. However, there may be circumstances where a proposed development raises issues of such regional importance or strategic interest that the application should be called in for the Department, in effect, to take over the role of decision maker. My Department has published guidance on the notification and call-in of applications that highlights the legislative procedures to be complied with by district councils when notifying the Department on all types of applications, including potential call-in cases, and also provides an indication of the matters that may be considered by the Department when deciding whether an application should be called in. These include considering the relevant development plan, the opinion of a statutory consultee, the national importance of the proposal, the relationship of the proposal with a regionally significant application, the significance of the development to the whole or part of Northern Ireland, and any potential significant effects a proposal may have outside of Northern Ireland. Each case will, however, be considered on its own merits, and the fact that a particular development proposal may be complex or controversial wouldn't necessarily mean that it be of strategic interest or regional importance. Mr. McQuillan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, you recently called in the Camborne One Farm, which is causing a bit of a breeze in my constituency, um, and you issued a notice of an opinion to approve. This is at odds with the local council. What happens next to this application? I, I thank the member for that uh, question. And that there has indeed been some attention around uh, my decision, A, to call in this application, and B, to approve it. I have uh, written to the Council not only to outline my decision to approve and the rationale behind that, but also to inform Council of their next steps. The Council have a 28-day period during which they can uh, call for or ask for a hearing on my decision in effect, and should they choose to do so, that hearing will be held uh, by the PAC, who will then uh, give their determination on the application. However, the final decision will ultimately then come back to me, but should the Council wish to go down that route and the PAC decide that I was wrong, the decision would come back to me and I could 
reverse it. However, I would be very doubtful that the PAC would find that and the decision would come back to me either way. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Minister, when you say you doubt that the PAC will change that, have you already made up your mind then? So is there actually no point of the, cause, of the Causeway Coast and Glens Council members coming in front of you? Because if you're already saying in the chamber here today that you've made up your mind, you've breached that entire process, by calling in this planning application, you've undermined the councillors on the planning committee of Causeway Coast and Glens. And I think it was disgraceful that the way the chief planner in that area and the chair of the planning committee found out by your decision was actually through the BBC. I, I thank the member for that question. I would, however, correct him saying I haven't breached any process or any uh, procedure, and I, I, I would share his disdain at the manner in which elected representatives found out about this decision. I don't know how the BBC got hold of this so quickly either, and uh, I'd like to place that on, on, on record. I think, will, will the Council now have a chance? They can ask for a hearing. I'm not saying that I would then overrule the PAC should they come to a different uh, view to me. However, I'm saying it would have to come back to me, and I doubt very much that they would come to a different conclusion than I have, given that both council planners and planners within the DOE both thought this was a nailed-on approval. I may actually have done the council a favour in some respects. Given uh, I was I caught the end of uh, Minister Bell's question time there, and there was something around the Northern Ireland renewables or, or rocks situation here, but given the, the failure to issue an approval to what I think is a blatantly approvable application would have been stopped or stymied by Council, I think Council could have been leaving themselves in a very precarious position and would have been open not just to a, call, a planning application or a planning appeal, but also then to further legal proceedings. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, Thanks very much, Mr. Primpton, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> and it appears whenever you mention the word renewables in this place, you have to get things firmly on the record or whenever you meet a minister to make sure you have someone there to take an independent minute, as I did. Uh, but um, <clears throat> can I ask the, the uh, minister to outline what progress has been made towards meeting the programme for government renewable energy targets as his department fits into that? Uh, I thank the member for that question. Indeed, programme for government targets are a consideration, also a material consideration, when dealing with or processing any planning application. The member will be aware that I recently published the strategic planning policy statement on the 28th of September. The SPS, SPPS consolidates, updates and improves the policy context of the suite of planning policy statements, including PPS 18, Renewable Energy. The aim of the SPPS in relation to renewable energy is to facilitate the siting of renewable energy generating facilities in appropriate locations within the built and natural environment to achieve Northern Ireland's renewable energy targets and to realise the benefits of renewable energy without compromising other environmental assets of acknowledged importance. The SPPS Inter Alia will continue to support and contribute to the renewable energy target of 40% of electricity consumption here in the north from renewable resources by 2020, as set out by the executive and as indicated in DETI's strategic energy framework. Furthermore, DETI has advised that the executive's 2015 programme for government target of 20 cent renewable ener energy generation is being met. Call Ms. Clare Sugden. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And to bring this um, issue back to where we started, does the Minister now concede that his decision to initially approve CAM Burn Wind Farm was ill advised on planning legislation? And since, through two priority written questions, which he has yet to answer for, from me, that he has now done a quick U turn to abide by the law? <laughs> I, I look forward to reading that question again in Hansard. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I haven't conceded anything. I have outlined what the Council could do, should they wish to challenge my decision, which, let me state quite clearly, I believe was the right decision and is a legal, a legal decision. Uh, 
I'm taking, I, I have also answered a priority question from the member. She may not have received the answer yet. I would like to let the House know I have answered that question, and I am quite, I suppose, taken aback by her, I suppose, shall we say, recent interest in this planning application. It has been, the, pla the application has been, uh, it was within the department for a considerable time. It's been with the council for six months or more. And uh, the first I heard, or the first that the council heard uh, from the member on it, was when she learned about it on the BBC as well. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Uh, question number five, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The number of road deaths in 2015 is a serious concern, and I extend my sympathy to those who have lost loved ones and also those who have suffered life changing injuries. So far this year, 61 people have died, compared to 69 for the same time last year. At the beginning of the year, severe cuts were made by the executive to my department's budget allocation. Despite the very challenging financial position, I was able to allocate just over a million pounds to road safety communications, grants and educational materials. In recent weeks, I have been able to supplement this with a further £184,000 through internal reallocations. Despite the regrettable 50 per cent reduction of the road safety budget, my department continues to take a range of actions to reduce deaths and serious injuries on our roads. We focus on problem areas such as drink driving, speeding, carelessness and inattention, and on groups which are overrepresented in the casualty figures. These are the key focus of the Road Traffic Amendment Bill, which completed its consideration stage in June. I will shortly be bringing the bill back to the Assembly to conclude its legislative passage. In March, I launched a new motorcyclist safety campaign, and in June, I launched the 2015-16 Road Safety Grant Scheme, through which I have approved funding for 15 projects across the north. Also in June, I launched a, safe, a road safety community toolkit to give local voluntary groups all the resources they need to organise events, bringing road safety messages into the heart of local communities. Also in June, I rolled out the Safe Driving Teaching Aid, enabling driving instructors to address road safety with the learner driver. My department also continues to provide a range of resources and schemes to be used by teachers to allow them to improve road safety behaviours in children and young people. I can assure you that I remain fully committed to continuing working with my executive colleagues, the PSNI and other stakeholders to improve road safety and to reduce casualties. Mr McKinney for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure this House uh, joins with the Minister in recognising the deep pain felt in families and communities as a result of such tragedies. But could the Minister further outline what action would be taken to target vulnerable uh, road users, such as uh, younger people and older people? There are many activities being carried out through the Department's mix of channels to address vulnerable road users. Through its social media activity, TV, radio and outdoor advertising, the Department regularly reminds drivers to give extra consideration to children, older road users and those with less protection, such as pedestrians, cyclists and motorcyclists. Messages also address vulnerable road users to increase their own safety as they share the road with motorists, such as wearing high-vis vests or coats, crossing at a safe place, obeying the rules of the road as advised in the Highway Code, amongst others. My department provides a range of resources and schemes to be used by teachers to allow them to improve the road safety of their pupils. Among others, these initiatives include the Road Safety Teaching Aid Calendar, the Enhanced Cycling Proficiency Scheme, the Junior Road Safety Officer Scheme and Education Packs. These initiatives have been very well received and for the most recent initiatives, early indications show a positive response. Through various channels, the Department reminds parents that it is their responsibility to ensure children are properly restrained when travelling in vehicles. I have recently approved funding, as I said in my original answer, for 15 road safety projects through the Road Safety Grant Scheme. Two of the projects address older road user safety, which is one of my road safety priorities. I have therefore approved additional funding to each project to extend their coverage to an even wider audience. 
One project addresses the importance of fitness to drive through drama. The second project will be delivering a comprehensive training package on alcohol and drugs awareness, hazard identification, and also provide a series of driving assessments for older people. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Mr. Kakaloshin. Uh, does the Minister see merit in a financial review of the cost of local government reform, especially considering the transferring functions such as the planning portal and some off-street car parks is estimated by Nilga to cost somewhere in the region of over £100 million, which is hardly cost neutral to councils? Uh, thank you, Mr Pr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. It was always anticipated as we approached local government reform and as this assembly voted for local government reform, that there were, would be significant costs in the, the, the beginning. However, that these went offset against the savings that would be yielded in the medium to long term would pale in significance. I am aware of major concerns uh, felt by and, and across local government on some of the issues that the member had referred to. As regards the planning portal, I think the problems are a lot less than they are with the transfer of on, uh, street car parking. Responsibility for that does ultimately lie uh, with DRD. It was they who transferred that function. However, in my opinion, and that of local government, the budget that transferred with the function was nowhere near adequate. As regards a review, I will continue to work with local government, uh, chiefly through the partnership panel. I am, however, meeting a group of chief executives of uh, the, the new councils uh, tomorrow, and I'd be happy. Well, I won't be happy to, but I have no doubt that I will hear from them more on this issue tomorrow and through uh, the, the various fora in which I engage with them. And they know, local government knows that they have a friend in me, and I will do everything I can. To, to persuade my executive colleagues to ensure that local government is adequately resourced to fulfil their new duties and provide good services for their ratepayers at good value. Roisin for supplementary. Welcome the fact that the Minister said that he would work in a partnership. I hope he would do so, particularly through Nogo and Salas. But he does agree that there have been discrepancies uh, regarding the transfer and functions and the projected cost impacts to councils uh, than those earlier projected by DOE and indeed other government departments. Well, uh, I, I, I thank the member for that question. Again, I, I, I slated another department there, but, but I, can't, I, I can speak about them. I can't really speak for them. I can speak about DOE and the function that we transferred, that of uh, planning. I took a brave and bold step, I suppose, and unique among ministers or, or, or those with responsibility for departments that were transferring functions. In that early in the previous financial year, I had ring-fenced the budget for planning that was to go to uh, local government, so it would actually not be impacted by the in-year cuts that, that the departments were facing. As a result, I had to make bigger cuts in different areas of my department, and that was based solely on my belief that the functions should be transferred at a point that is rate neutral uh, to the, or cost neutral to the rate pair in the new councils. I came up to the mark on that one. I am aware that some issues have arisen around planning. Like I say, they are minuscule in comparison to some of the other issues uh, facing uh, local government. However, that does not diminish my appetite to resolve it. Mr. Sean Roger. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Obviously, wind farms are a very topical issue. Could I ask the Minister to outline your, your um, views on? The development of wind farms in areas of outstanding natural beauty. I uh, thank the member for that question, and they are indeed very topical uh, th th this afternoon. Following the transfer of the majority of planning functions to local councils, the determination of most wind, wind energy proposals does now fall to local councils, as, as we've discussed uh, earlier. And determining 
Now, as such, my department's strategic plan and policy statement requires that the environmental, landscape, visual and amenity impacts associated with or arising from renewable energy development are given proper consideration and that adequate protection is afforded to the region's natural and cultural heritage features. And while plan and policy does not rule out wind farm development within AONBs, it is a key policy objective to ensure that the environmental, landscape, visual and amenity impacts of such developments in such sensitive areas are fully considered before any decision is reached. In addition, the SPPS makes clear that a cautious approach to renewable energy development proposals will apply within designated landscapes which are of significant value, such as areas of outstanding natural beauty. This is one, one area where, within the SPPS, we have actually strengthened policy, made it less permissive. I know there had been a view among members, and it was came across very strong in the Environment Committee's uh, re report on wind energy, and, and that is something that I did respond to and did tighten up within the SPPS. Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for that and ask him what is his view on the proposed wind farm development in the Mourns? I, I thank the, the member for the question. He's bringing it back to the Mourns again. An application for Grog and Do wind farm was received by Strategic Planning Division on the 16th of March this year. It proposes 12 turbines with an overall height of 125 metres with a potential power amp output of 39.6 megawatts. An environmental statement to accompany the application was received on the 31st of March, and the application was declared in Article 31 on that date. Therefore, it would be, be determined centrally by the Department. The application has been advertised in accordance with the EIA regulations, neighbour notifications carried out, and consultations sent to appropriate bodies, including Newry Mourn and Down Council. To date, 41 objections from third parties have been received, and just yesterday, actually, a letter of support came in. The application is still under consideration by my department, and therefore I can't comment much further on it. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Speaker, uh, and I would ask the Minister um, he will remember what has been done to create a registry of ancient and culturally important trees in Northern Ireland? Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank Mr. Cree. I, was, I thought it was about a registry of, of Crees rather than, than, than trees. I know this is an issue, an issue that he has raised to me in written correspondence be, be, before, and one that I have received quite a bit of correspondence on through social media. The patchwork of native broad-leaved woods and hedgerows that comprise our countryside gives it a unique appearance in the context of Northwest Europe. Many of Northern Ireland's native woodlands and hedgerows possess high biodiversity, landscape and cultural value, and have been given statutory protection as special areas of conservation, areas of special scientific interest, and areas of outstanding natural beauty. But while many trees of special interest due to their great age or other factors are located within the foregoing protected areas, many do grow in the general countryside or in urban areas and deserve and require individual protection. Many of the legislative functions regarding the protection of trees and the management of existing trees and the consideration of further protection or future protection of trees, for example, the making of tree preservation orders transferred to the councils on the 1st of April this year. Councils also have the powers to draw up local development plans which can provide policy and guidance on the management and protection of trees as part of the development proposals. I know the Woodland Trust are campaigning very vociferously for a national tree register to celebrate our remarkable trees. I welcome the initiative for the creation of a register of trees. Uh, of national special interest for Northern Ireland, and I have instructed my officials to consider resources required to establish and maintain a register, and to advise me of who would be best placed to administer such a register. Mr. Craig, for a supplementary. Yes, and I thank uh, the Minister for that. Um, that is indeed good news. But, Minister, do you envisage then that the only protection would be 
tree protection orders, or would we need some other form uh, of protection for these, particularly the ancient trees? You may be one off. I, I, I thank the member for that uh, supplementary question. As I've said, I've, I've tasked my officials to do some work on this. They're not going to do so in isolation. I've instructed them to actually go to the Woodland Trust to hear their views on this and uh, to go out to the councils as well, who, like I said, do have responsibility for protection of, of trees now. I'm not passing the buck to them. I'm saying here quite clearly today, I want to work with councils and with other interested third parties to, to, to see that this gets done. Mr. Basil McCray. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, in relation to the licensing of bonfires, um, are you aware that some councils provide differential funding for bonfires as to whether they are traditional or non-traditional? And you are considering the possibility of licensing uh, any such bonfires. I wonder if you could just update us uh, on your thinking and progress to date on that matter. I, I thank uh, Mr. McRae for that uh, question. This is a, a, another issue that I have announced my intention uh, to do work on and, and resolve what is a perennial problem here in Northern Ireland, where so many communities suffer at the hands of, I suppose, badly organised bonfires, and bonfires that are organised by people whose motives aren't of bringing communities together, but are of creating division and indeed chaos in their own uh, communities. I have been working, and my officials have been working behind the scenes with councils on this issue. There is a lot of good practice done across councils. We have seen across the north a reduction in the number of, of, of bonfires and indeed I was reading a report in the Belfast Telegraph today where Belfast said there had been a huge reduction in the number of fires actually burning tyres, which is to be welcomed. So there is good practice and it's important that we develop that good practice and roll it out and ensure that it is uniform across all council areas. Uh, the, the, the list of options that I ha had come forward with I think everyone here, everyone in their right mind agreed that the third option, that of introducing a licensing scheme, was the best way to go. I think, again, this has to be uniform across all council areas. And I do know some councils allocate uh, bonf bonfire management schemes money. They do give money to community groups who are organising bonfires. And I know the issue to which I think the member is getting that in some cases the group organising the bonfire might not necessarily be the group who get the, the money. That's something that we need to get stamped out. I'm not trying to stamp out bonfires per se. I know there are a lot of people who run these things responsibly and who enjoy them and do see them as part of their culture. Mr McRae for a supplementary. Speaker. Uh, yes, Minister. Um, are you aware that some community groups feel that when you put funding into an issue that it attracts the attention from outside agencies, in particular, I will say it here, paramilitaries, and that community groups are looking, if you are going to have a licensing scheme, that such funding would be properly recognised? And would you take the opportunity to meet some community leaders that would explain the problems that they're having in this matter? I thank Mr McRae uh, for his question. I said previously in, in this assembly the need for collective, if not unanimous, political support for a scheme like this to succeed. And it's not just political support, it's community support. Therefore, it's extremely important that we consult far and wide. And I would be happy to meet uh, the, the community group or groups to which uh, the, the, the member refers, as I have already met uh, people from diverse communities, shall we say, discussing this issue, as well as, as, as I've said earlier, continuing discussions with councils and indeed other departments and agencies. Time is up. That concludes our question time. I invite the members to take their ease while we change the top table.